I want to welcome everybody as we join together for a time of worship. As today we're going to do something unique, but yet also something timely. And that is celebrate the Lord's Supper. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we're going to experience it in many ways like the people did during the very first Passover. Because in the first Passover, they came and understood that this was temporary. Things were about to change. And when those things were about to change, they had to make preparation for that because God was going to do something marvelous that night when he would pass over the people and he would bring judgment upon Egypt. One day that Passover is going to be completed when God comes and he passes over us who have faith in Jesus Christ not because we're more righteous than anyone else, but because God's grace, we have accepted his grace and put it into our life. And when we have, he's going to pass over us. And we have to then realize that one day we're going to be in his presence. And when he passes over us, he's going to cover our sin, he's going to forgive our sin, he's going to welcome us into his kingdom. And just like the people of Israel were to get ready for their trip, you and I are to be ready. To be ready at a moment's notice, exactly when God desires for us to be ready. To be ready to move out, to move on, to be with him. And so today we've got traveling things. Today when we celebrate the supper, we have our plastic glasses and our paper plates. I've brought in my traveling clothes. I've got my, my coat. I've got my traveling pants. I've got my hat, my gloves, my sunglasses. Everything's in place, ready for me to go. And don't forget that I also have my mask. I'm ready to travel today. Are you ready to travel? To go to be with our Heavenly Father? If God leaves us here, the Apostle Paul says, the amazing thing is, is for us to live here is still going to be service of our Savior. And it's going to be beneficial. It's going to make a difference in the people's lives. It's going to make a difference in our lives. And so if Jesus tarries, however long he tarries, he... He has an action that we are to do. He has this ministry that we are to do. We are to give our lives in that way. But if he calls us home, Scripture says it in very simple terms. It's to gain. To experience God's presence as never before. That's what we look forward to. That's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to share today as we worship together. So I want you to join with me as we begin this time as we talk to our Heavenly Father. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the love that you have poured into our lives through him. Thank you for the forgiveness and the transformation he brings. Thank you for the promise of the glory that is coming. And we just want to rejoice today as we celebrate the suffering that Jesus initiated to remind us of all these things. For this we ask, this we pray in Jesus' name. Let's join together as we sing and as we worship him.
I want you to pray with me. Father, how we thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ. For the supper that he gave us. And Father, as Paul would remind us, this is done so that we could remember him. Remember who he is. Remember what he has done. And then to remember in our life what he is doing. So, Father, today we want to give you the praise. We want to give you all the honor. And, Father, with that, we, in remembering him, we look forward to seeing him face to face. What a glorious day that will be. And so, Father, we anticipate that day as we celebrate this supper. So, Father, speak to us. As we open your word, draw us closer and closer to you. For Father, this we ask and pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord's Supper has historical references in the Passover. It has God's covenant, which carries us from Adam to us today. This promise that God has given us, this wonderful gift that he has poured out to us through Jesus Christ. And understanding what that is and who that is and what that means to our individual lives and our collective life as the body of Christ is found in God's scripture throughout it. But today we're going to take a passage to help us to see it. It kind of opens it up. It's found in the book of Romans. We're going to look actually at passage in chapter 3. We're going to look at a passage in chapter 5. We're going to conclude with a passage in chapter 6. But I just want you to hear the marvelous message of the hope that we have, that we have found in Jesus Christ. And so go ahead and take your Bibles, open them up. We're in Romans chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 21. And then we're just going to allow God to speak to us 
And as we do, we're going to put it in the context of getting ready to participate together with the supper. Because it gives us this marvelous picture of all of it. For hear how Paul writes. He's writing to the church at Rome. And he says, but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. This righteousness that's coming from God is not coming from the law. It's coming from God himself. It's God's righteousness that's coming to us. To which both the law that was given to Moses and the prophets, which was preaching to the people of Israel in the midst of all of their struggle and giving us hope for the future, he says all of these testify about this coming righteousness. For this righteousness is from God. No place else. This righteousness comes from God himself. This is his righteousness. And it comes to us through faith in Jesus Christ, by our trust, our faith in him. To all of us who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned. Now in chapter 3, he reminds us that both Jew and Gentile have sinned, and that's why judgment was brought. And so he says, there's no difference, for all have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God. But then he also says, all are justified, set right before God, freely by his grace. By his grace. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to get it. There's nothing we can do to keep it. It comes to us. It's a gift. We're going to see that. This is a gift from God. It comes to us. It falls short of his glory. We fall short of his glory, but he justifies us. How? Through the redemption that came. Redemption. This is where we go back to the Passover. Redemption begins to be understood when the people of Israel left slavery and by the power of God left Egypt, moved out, and then God settled them in their promised land. God did all of that. That was his redemption. And of course, he still had flawed human beings as the people of Israel failed over and over and over and over again. But God's grace never stopped coming. His grace continued being offered by his love to them with a promise. That promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came, he says through that, redemption came by Jesus Christ. That which would remove from slavery to set free, that which would receive God's grace and give a hope of a promised land, all came through Jesus Christ. It all came because of him. It's all about Jesus in this. So God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. Now he takes us back to the law. Takes us to the day of atonement. When the people would offer sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, they would shed blood in order that forgiveness could come. They would put sins upon the scapegoat and send the scapegoat out. That day of atonement was a day of remembering that it took this in order for forgiveness of sin to come. And God said all of that came by Jesus Christ. For in him a sacrifice atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. His justice. The minute we sin. When Adam and Eve first partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the promise was given that they would surely die. To eat of this tree meant death. Death entered. How did we know that? Well, they began to hide from God. They began to hide from the one who gave them life, breathed into them life, provided for them everything. And now they were hiding from him because they were afraid of him. Because what happened? They knew something happened inside. Death had entered their life. Life now had an end. 
Life now had judgment. They received that when they received the curses. And that judgment comes so that we could understand. He says, this judgment comes. And when Jesus came, he took that sacrifice, all of the sacrifice upon himself, in order that he could provide that atonement so that he could justify us so that justice would be fulfilled. Sin must be condemned. And it must be rectified in that when justice comes, death is going to reign. But because God himself came to take that justice, Jesus, when he died on the cross, all of God's justice came upon him. All of God's punishment came upon him. All that hell would be came upon him. All was upon Jesus when he took our sin. When he who knew no sin became sin for us. He became our sacrifice. He said beforehand God had left these unpunished. God was showing them judgment, but punishment hadn't come yet until punishment came in death. And then the ultimate punishment that would come in the future, when the day of judgment would come, and those that did not put their faith in Christ, those who were not being obedient to God, those who re rejected him, he's going to send away by their choice. Why? Because he had been preparing the way of grace. He did this to demonstrate his justice, it says in verse 26. For at the present time, so as to be just, the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God. <coughs> just, where is their boasting? Is it included on what principle? On that observ observing the law? If you think you are more righteous than anybody else, you are deceived because there's no one righteous. We can't boast. I cannot boast in my righteousness because my righteousness, Scripture describes as filthy rags. If I think I'm better than anybody else, I am a liar because I am filled with that filthiness. Jesus was never filled with that filthiness. He was pure. He was sinless. He was righteous. He who is righteous took our sin. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. We can't, the law is not, we can do everything we think the law says, but yet if we don't abide by the first one, that is, there is to be nothing between us and God. We know the very first time we sinned, there was something between us and God. Therefore, he cannot be our God in all. He reminds us that that is coming to us because we can't do it by how good we try to be. Thus he says, for if we maintain that a, faith is a man is justified by faith, apart from observing the law, is God the God of Jews only? Then he says, is, it, is God just a Jewish God? No. Is not God the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, the Gentiles too, to everybody, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. The only way you get there is by faith, period. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? <laughs> no, not at all. Because then we can live by faith and thus uphold the law. We have no other gods before him when we have him by faith. We honor him with our life. We honor him with our words. We worship him in the way that he desires. Why? Because we uphold the law. We then look to others and we uphold the law. Why? We don't steal from them. We don't lie about them. We don't kill them. We don't take 
by adultery what is theirs. We don't covet the things they have. We take what we receive from God and we're grateful for whatever God has blessed us because we understand that God has given us everything. That includes the very essence of life itself. He then talks about this justification in chapter 4. How it came from Abraham. Abraham said yes to God and God would credit it to him as righteousness. Then in chapter 5, he just picks it up and here he, he says, therefore, since we have been now justified through faith, we have peace with God. Adam and Eve were hiding in the garden. They have no peace. They were afraid. They were guilty. But when we understand we have been justified in him, he takes away all of the guilt. Romans 8 says, For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Even though we struggle still with sin, he says, I justified you and it's all gone. And you can now have peace with me. Peace with God through Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ because he's the only sacrifice that has ever been given. That's why he is the only way. It's not that all the other religions are trying not to get to God because many of them are trying to get to God. The only way God gets us is because he came to us and the only time he ever came to us is in Jesus Christ. That's why it has to be faith in him. For he says, through whom we have gained access now to God. We've gained access in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God now. When we have peace, we have hope. Because now we know that the future is good. Because even when we come to judgment day, the future is good. Why? There is no condemnation because the one who is judged, Jesus, will look at us and welcome us because his blood will be upon us. We will have accepted his atonement. So we rejoice. And not only so, but we also rejoice then now in our suffering. If you're a Christian and you got this idea that the minute God comes into your life, everything's going to be great, (laughs) somebody else is talking to you. Because Jesus said, in this life, you will have trials. But he said, take heart, for I have overcome the world. He said, take heart in me, but understand, you're going to have trials. As Christians, we do suffer. Paul wrote some of his most wonderful letters, Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, from where? Jail. He knew what suffering was. Jesus knew what suffering was. He proved it on the cross. So he says, we have to understand. We should rejoice in our sufferings. How can, you know, most of us are asking now, how do we rejoice in this pandemic? How do we rejoice when we can't meet together? When even when we get together, we're socially distanced apart. I mean, it's even going through the drive throughs to get food from some place that they're cooking that you can't go in. They're handing stuff to you on trays. They're making sure things are covered. They've got gloves on their hands. They've got masks on their face. People are driving up with masks on their face, gloves in their hands, trying to make sure that we don't get this. And we're wondering, what about all of this? God tells us in the midst of everything we're going through, we should rejoice as believers who have peace with him, who have received this atonement. We rejoice, why? Because we know that suffering will give us perseverance, the ability to get through, to live this life with perseverance, 
we are going to continue. Why? Because we're going to bring honor to God here. We're going to witness for God here. We're going to let God see what he wants to do in our lives as he takes us from suffering to perseverance. But perseverance, it doesn't stop there because perseverance works in us and it gives us character. Character where when you have that kind of character, you can be counted on. When guys prepare for war, when they go through boot camp, and then they have specific things that they're to train for, they train, and they make it as difficult as they possibly can. They get it to the very point of simulating war without them actually being in that combat but they're still firing live rounds. They're still doing things that could harm them. That's why every time we hear these things of people who go through training, every once in a while, somebody dies in training. Why? Because they're trying to get them ready for war. And when they go to war, when you hear them come back, and they come back with all sorts of trials, I pray for our veterans because of the things that they have gone through. When they come back, what got them back, every one of them will tell you. It was because we trusted two things. We trusted in each other. And we trusted our training. When we go through life, the Bible describes this as a war. We as believers come together. And God says so that we can help one another persevere. But that perseverance gives us character to where then we can count on each other because we count on the one who is training us and filling us. And that character gives us what we need as we persevere. That character helps us to be there for each other. And that character demonstrates God's character because when God trains us, it's not the character of a drillist sergeant. It's a character of a loving, caring, heavenly father who's already endured everything for us on the cross with his son. When Jesus died, God took everything and he puts it in us so that his character can come through us. We know that character produces hope. I can persevere. I have the character to get through. It doesn't matter what because God gives me hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Why? Because through all of this, God has this marvelous waterfall. It's called his bucket. He has poured out onto us constantly, totally, and always. Never stops. No matter what, where we are, what we are going through, it never stops. God is pouring his love into you. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who he has given us. When we come to know Christ, God puts his Holy Spirit in us so that he may teach us, so that we can learn how to receive. And we receive God's love. He's pouring it into us. Because you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, which we were. Sinners, we're ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. As we see, as those who come back from war, those who have laid down their lives, they might die for somebody they understand. They go to war to die for our country. Why? Because they think we're worth it. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were the ungodly, we were sinners. Christ died for us. Christ died for us. He took our death. He justified us by him dying your death and my death. He died the eternal death, the judgment that came from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
He took it. He took the death of every sin that has been poured out through all of mankind. He took all of those sins, which was bringing forth death into life. He took all of that. He died in our place for us. Since now we have been through him justified by his blood. He goes, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Justified. It's not wrath anymore that's coming to us. It becomes our discipline to make us more like Christ. For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through death by his son. We're reconciled, we're connected to him. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Aren't you glad that Good Friday wasn't the last day? Aren't you glad that Resurrection Day was coming? When Jesus took up his life again, when he took up his life now, because he has taken death on and he has now conquered death. He has got life. In him was light and that light, light was the life of men. Jesus came to light our way to himself so that he could take his life, his righteousness, and pour it into every corner of our life. To work in our life with that power. For when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Adam and Eve were hiding in the garden. Because of what Jesus Christ did, we don't have to hide. We can come, and we can bring to him freely our shortcomings, our failures, our sin. Because you see, we still do that. But his goal, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And so what he is doing now is he's knocking out all of the sin in our lives. All of the habits that are ungodly. All of the character traits that were not his character traits. He's doing all of that in us. He's sanctifying us. He's purifying us. It's exactly what John writes in 1 John when he tells them that Jesus is by his blood that we are forgiven, but in that he has come to purify us. To make us completely holy, sanctified, pure in him. That's why chapter 6, verse 23, it summarizes it all. For the wages of sin, we get paid to sin, the wages of sin is death. When you sin, you're going to reap the benefits of sin. It's going to bring death. You're going to receive the payment for your sin. It's going to bring death. But the awesome thing is, is God does not want anyone to die. Because he came to us and he said, not only is the wages of sin death, but the gift that God gives is life through Jesus Christ. He's come that you and I might have the life eternal, abundant, filled with peace, filled with joy, filled with hope, filled with righteousness, filled then also with patience for each other, with kindness towards each other, with gentleness towards each other. And that extends not just to those that know Christ, but that extends to those who don't. Because we are to show them the difference Jesus makes. And that comes as God is in the process of changing us. 
I am not what I want to be. But as the saying goes, I'm not what I used to be in Christ. Because that's why he came. That's why we do this in remembrance of him. From Genesis, through as we come from Adam and Eve, through Abraham and his family, to Moses, as we come through the law and everything that comes through him to the kingdom, ultimately through David, the one whose son will never stop being on the throne, that is Christ. All the way through to the promise of one day we will sit down at a banquet feast. Banquet feast is called the wedding supper of the Lamb. When we gather around that table, the entire body of Christ will be there. There will be no social distancing there. There will be hugs, handshakes. We will get the righteous kiss that God gives. We will be able to share it with everyone. You see, it will be us together, bound together for eternity. We will be so bound as if we are one bride coming to the bridegroom. And you see, when you and I celebrate the supper, we celebrate the past of Passover. We celebrate the present of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We celebrate the future of what is to come. So wherever you are, stuck in your home, you've been there now for weeks. You're the ones who are going out and doing the shopping, so you get out and you know what it's like to go to the stores and see the shelves empty and to kind of make sure that you try to keep that distance. You know, going down those aisles, okay, how do I keep that six feet? How do I keep turned in the right way? How do I wait for them to get through here? I used to always kid people that Fred Myers, when I'd go in there and we'd meet each other as we'd come out and go into the different rows, I said, well, they, we need stoplights. You would think with social distancing we wouldn't need stoplights, but I think we need it more so that we can make sure we keep the distance. You see, whatever we face, there is coming a day when all of the pandemics are over. There's coming a day when all of the natural disasters are over. There's going to be a day when all of the wars are over. And we will sit down and see our Savior and experience Him. Today we're going to celebrate this supper. And as we celebrate this supper, take a look back at your life. Take a look back and see what your life has been. And if you're a believer, when you take a look back at your life, see that place where you came to know Jesus Christ. If you've been a believer for a long time, you see that place where you came and found life. But look back and see all those places where God reminded you of that life. If you're not a believer, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that today you will have heard this marvelous message of what God has done for you in Christ. That today you will put your faith. You will trust what God has done. You will look to the cross of Christ and thank God that he took your sin. And then lay yourself before him so that he can fill your life with his presence. So that he can forgive you, cleanse you, justify you in that instant. And begin to make you like Jesus every day from that point forward. Because you now have a brand new life. At that point you become a new creation in God. Today, if that is your decision... Pray a prayer like this. 
Heavenly Father, today, I thank you for Jesus. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me. Change me. Help me each day from this point on to follow you, to know you, to experience you. And in that, Father, let me give you the praise for every day forward to the day when we meet face to face, when this life is over. And if you've prayed that prayer, God's going to come into your life. And he's going to begin to radically begin to change you. And when you make that decision, contact the church. Contact us. Let us know of that decision. Let somebody come alongside and help you. Learn to really know what it is to walk in a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Today, we all get to participate in this supper because of what Jesus has done for us. As believers, when you take a look back, also see how are you in your relationship with Christ at this moment. Make sure you're connected to him, that he has cleansed you, that you have done your part for today, you have laid your sin before him and allowed you to afresh sanctify you up to this moment. And then let us all look forward to the day that is coming when we shall see him. Not like we see him today with the eyes of faith, but we shall see him as he is. Because this mortal flesh will have taken on immortality. This perishable stuff will be unperishable. The amazing grace that God has given us of what this life will be when everything is complete. Look to that day as we participate in this supper. With that, I want you to join me. Jesus in the upper room express these truths, and we'll talk about a couple of them in a moment. But when he did that, he prayed. He gave thanks for what God had done. So will you pray with me? Father, we thank you today for the grace of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for his provision as he took our sin upon the cross. We thank you, Father, for his power which comes into our life in the form of new life, the resurrected life, the resurrected Jesus living in us. We just want to give you praise and thanks. And Father, help us as we live that life so that we might encourage one another and the world might know that you and you alone are God. Thank you again for giving us this grace. Thank you for giving us this hope. For Father, this we pray. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get your materials that we sent out. Uh, have some grape juice. We've got our grape juice. I recommended a tortilla because it's, it's an unleavened bread. You can make your own unleavened bread. There are recipes for that. There are different things. This was just the simplest way to do that. And, of course, you're now in your home. Your home may be just you. Take one. Do it yourself. Your home may be like my home. There's two of us. My wife is with us this morning, and she's going to come. And she's going to sit here with me. And yes, I am touching my wife. I've been doing that every day of the pandemic. We've been in the same house together. I, I pray for all of you that went through with the COVID whose your spouse or family member had to quarantine themselves in the house. But if any of us have to go through that, I pray God's grace. If any of you are going through it now, I pray for God's grace with you. I pray that if somebody is bringing you the Lord's Supper and they're sliding it by the door so that they can go away and you can come and get however it is, 
We joined together just like they did that night. They were ready to go when the Passover came. Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross when he gave to his disciples and he took the bread. And the scripture says he broke it. And then he gave it to them. And he told them to take and eat because this was his body. This represented his sacrifice. But it not only represents his sacrifice, the body that was broken, but it also represents the body that rose from the dead and the body that would become us, the body of Christ. And so today we're going to give thanks for the body that was broken, which came to our broken lives so that the body that was raised could give our brokenness life. So let us pray together. Father, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the blessing of Jesus who died in our place, whose body was broken for us, who offered to us life and hope. And thank you that that body rose from the dead. And when he ascended to you, he then was able to come and be with us the power of the Spirit and the presence of Jesus and the abiding of the Father. You came and you made us your own. And today as we partake, let us remember all of this as we celebrate this supper today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remembering our Savior, Jesus. that night Jesus also took the cup and he gave thanks for it and we will do that in a moment but he took the cup now that night he poured it into one cup when he poured it into one cup he passed it and he told them to drink of it today we're doing individual cups. As we do those individual cups, we are reminded of the situation we're in. But on that night, Jesus reminded them of what was important. He told them to take. And he would tell them to drink because he says, this is my blood which was shed for you. For the forgiveness of sin. This is the new covenant. This is the covenant established in his blood. The blood would bring forgiveness. The blood would bring atonement. The blood would bring covering. So that one day when judgment comes, judgment will pass over. And we will enter into his kingdom. Blood represents all of that. Because you see, the blood represents the fact that when all of that takes place, we step into God's glory, perfect, pure, in Christ. Covered by his blood, his blood on the door frames of our lives, his blood cleansing us, forgiving us, and transforming us. And we celebrate that, all of that, when we remember him in this supper. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you again for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made upon the cross. Thank you for the hope that now we have in you because of forgiveness. Thank you for the promise, Father, of knowing that judgment will pass over. Condemnation is gone. And hope fills our life. 
all because of your covenant established in the blood of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we give thanks for that today. In the precious and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Remember Jesus. Now the Bible says when they finished, when the supper was done, they began to gather around and got ready to go to the garden. They were getting ready to go to the garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't an easy time coming up for Jesus because he was getting ready to die for our sins. The disciples were getting ready. They didn't realize this would deserve him. Today, you and I are sitting today. Jesus has already died for our sins. We have no idea what the future holds. Jesus has offered to us this amazing life, and we live that in him. And it comes as we understand that we dedicate ourselves, we give ourselves to him. And when we participate in the supper, we remember everything he's done so that we might follow him in obedience throughout the rest of our life. And that comes from a hunger inside of us, a hunger for him. Today, they sang a hymn, it says, well, today we're going to sing a hymn, and it's his hymn we as a church have been singing for quite a while. It's how we end most of our services because it talks about that hunger. As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for him. Does I have that hunger? And as I pray that to him, it's so that I might give honor to him in everything I do. And I pray today that you will join us. You may be one in your house. May your neighbors hear you sing. You may be collectively in that room. There may be three of you and not a one of you can carry a tune in a bucket. Let that one note, those three notes, whatever it is, make a joyful racket to him. Let us celebrate him. If you have been blessed with the most beautiful voice in the world, let it sing forth in the beauty of this day. All of it going to the Father who receives it all as praise to him. Let us join together as we sing. As